Well, good morning again. Thank you for coming together with us as a family of believers. We are not just a group, we are a family of believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me read our text for this morning. Won't you stand as we read this? God's infallible, inerrant word. Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 19, our text for today. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where, neither, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Father, what an important text. Father, open our understanding of this text this morning. Teach us, but not just filling our heads. Father, filling our hearts. Set us in the right place where it comes to our attitude on these things. That as we uh, live for you, even in this area, especially in this area, that we would honor you and glorify your name. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. As I read this text in its context, I'm, 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 frankly, I'm just so tempted to just keep reading all the way through chapter 7, And verse 12, because in reality, this is all connected together here. Actually, some will read the passage that I've just read and conclude that this is a collection of teachings from our Lord Jesus on different occasions, all then bound together in one one book in Matthew's Gospel. That Matthew is just recalling all of these different events and these teachings and putting them all together in one message. Uh, two prominent uh, examples of this would include R.T. France. Uh, his commentary on, on Matthew's gospel is wonderful. I've quoted from him many times. He would hold this to be a collection of Jesus' teachings bound together by Matthew. And yet, you know what he does? He, he goes on to explain these individual teachings that he sees, all connected together, all interacting with each other through the text. The other prominent example of this would be John Calvin, who does exactly the same thing. They, they, they hinge that position, frankly, on this text that we're looking at today. One of the reasons that they would make this claim is because in some of the verses that we're reading today, the word your is in the plural. And then in the very next verse, the word your is in the singular. And so... They say that these can't then be spoken all at the same time. Yet, in truth, there's nothing all that uncommon about using that kind of language when addressing a crowd. We're going to do that this morning, actually. Um, There's nothing unusual about this movement between plural and singular when Jesus is speaking to a crowd, and yet... He, he gives a teaching, and the teaching applies to everybody, but the application is for you, and you, and you. The application is not corporate. The application is personal, individual. And that's exactly what we see in this text. So as, as preachers, we do this all the time. No, this sermon is one message, 
given on one occasion to one particular crowd, and, and we can see the, the connections really throughout uh, the, this message which bind all of these statements together. Matthew didn't bind them together. Jesus Christ did. Here in our passage today, we see a, a continuation of a couple of threads that began earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. We see the idea of secret reward. Now, we've heard that a lot lately here in Matthew chapter 6. Verses 1 through 6, it was a prominent theme. Again, in verses 16 through 18. And here in our text, there is treasure in heaven. Those seem to be connected, don't they? Actually, a continuation going all the way back to the Beatitudes to open the Sermon on the Mount, the idea of spiritual bankruptcy and, and, and disadvantage on earth, mourning over sin, broken, hungering for thirst, uh, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. But our reward, our treasure, is beyond this world, stored up in heaven. We see this, this righteousness which Jesus said we are to live in that exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And it's, it's given a, a, a practical form here uh, for which we can look at and, and see what it is our lives are to look like. And of course, a continuation of what we've seen all the way back to chapter 5 and verse 21. We also see the theme developed and carried forward from here through chapter 7 and verse 12, a a singleness of focus in our living for the Lord. And so, yes, this one message given by the master teacher himself on one occasion to one crowd, given to teach us what Christian living looks like. Allow me to begin this morning with just an honest confession of my own heart. This is a difficult passage for me to preach this morning. As a church, we find ourselves in a position which is very uncomfortable. And, and all of the elders here at Fellowship will attest to this. Our provincial government has made it clear by imposing a $14,000 fine on a church in our province. As much as I might disagree with the doctrine of that church, they've made it clear their position by imposing this fine for simply holding worship services without rigid compliance to COVID mandates. I want to say I believe, but I'm going to strike those words. Our governing authority is wrong. They have greatly overstepped their authority by regulating what worship in the Lord's church must look like, and they have done so based on an emergency where there is no emergency. There is a virus with a 99.7% survival rate. Just think that through. 99.7% of people who contract the virus survive. And this has been used as a power grab to exert control over everything in society from healthcare to schools to businesses. I could care less about any of those, but they, this has been used to exert control over the church of Jesus Christ. It is my deep, deep conviction we should not bow to them and that they are, in fact, greatly impeding our ability to fulfill our calling As the church of Jesus Christ, I think they have also broken the law of our land. They have gone in opposition to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in our country. The very foundation of the law in our society, 
the highest of law in our country, they have violated. My conscience tells me that we should stand our ground, not pick a fight. Listen, that has never been our position. Our desire is not to pick a fight. But my conscience tells me because they are wrong, they are simply wrong that we should stand our convictions and carry on in our worship and our service as the Lord has called us to. I've been asked to do what is so difficult. I've been asked what is for us as a church so difficult about submitting to these requirements. And, and I get it. That's an, that's a, that's an honest question. Some say that we are, what we are being asked to do is easy for us to submit to, and it doesn't really impede what we must do as the church at all. And, and my response to this, to people who have asked individually, and, and, and I'll throw it out there for you this morning, my response to this is, as long as the perspective from which you are looking at this is simply that of an attender of a Sunday morning service, then that analysis would be absolutely right. There's nothing all that difficult about what they're asking us to do. But I ask you, church, is that what church is? Is church simply filling a pew on Sunday morning? Is that what it is? In order to submit, we must forsake fellowshipping openly, passionately, personally, in closeness of relationship. We must refrain from eating together, which again points to a closeness of relationship that there is to be within the body of Christ. We must withhold corporately instructing our children as there's just really no way for us to social distance our kids in Sunday school. We must withdraw from any outreach to the lost, which might include inviting more and more to come and to hear the gospel of our great Savior and allow us to get to know them socially, which is our calling, church. And I could go on and on and on. Yes, as long as you are here early enough, you can get a seat in the worship service. But church, what we do is so much more than that. And yet, our government has made it clear by imposing this fine on a church that they will in fact inflict uh, retribution financially for not complying with orders that frankly have absolutely nothing to do with health care. Nowhere in Canada, not one place in Canada is our hospitals overrun. Not one. Yet our authorities have made it clear that if a church does not comply, they will shut that church's doors by ruining them financially. Moreover, we, we live in a system where the only way to fight is to pony up hundreds of thousands of dollars to sue the government in light of charter violations. And I kid you not, that's what it would cost. So either way, for us as a small church, we either submit or they close our doors, breaking us financially. And so here I am this morning, preaching on a text that deals with treasure. A text that says we are to set our minds singly on treasure in heaven. The only reason for us to comply with the provincial mandates placed on the church to regulate how we fellowship is to protect our bank account. And so keep this church from financial ruin by our governing authority. And just being honest, 
That's the only reason for us to submit. There is simply no other reason for us to comply. And so, I'm just being honest, I I am greatly conflicted here. As elders, we've discussed this amongst ourselves much, and we're all in agreement that we should not submit to these regulations that are against the law of our land, and moreover, against the directives of our Lord regarding what fellowship in our church is to look like. Our coming together is not optional. It's not to be partial. We are to come as one body, family, together, corporately, to worship. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, five times, when you come together, when you come together, when you come together. It seems that coming together is not unimportant. It seems like it's exceptionally important. Do not forsake our assembling together, the book of Hebrews says. Well, the truth is they are to some extent forcing us to do just that, are they not? Because we, we currently can't actually have all of our regular attenders join in one setting. I mean, it's one thing for them to say you must. It's quite another for them to say you must or we will close you down. And so, do we submit or do we keep singly focused on the Lord and let Him deal with it? Do we allow the threat of financial ruin to change our course? Because frankly, that's the only reason that we're trying to comply with any of this nonsense. And so, I'm just, there's a great conflict in me. And, and listen, but here's my question. Am I simply looking out for treasure on earth? Am I just concerned about treasure on earth? That's where my heart's at in the midst of all this, as I preach this particular text today. Our passage is broken neatly into three parts. And we could easily preach a message on each of the three. Yet, as these all focus on one common theme, I think it's important for us to keep them together. We do see parallel teachings, particularly in Luke's gospel, for, for each of these three parts, on, on, on treasure in, in Luke 12, verses 33 through, and 34, on, on the eye in Luke 11, on slavery in Luke 16. So we see these same themes repeated in other gospel accounts. Yet here in Matthew's gospel, we see Jesus teaching these all together for the purpose of setting the disciples' proper attitude concerning material possessions. That is clear enough in the first section here on treasure in heaven, as well as in the third section here on serving one master, either serving money or serving God. But it's not so clear in that middle section here. But in truth, all three of these point to the very same truth. The common thread is single-mindedness. Let's look at the first illustration together that Jesus gives, beginning at verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moss and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moss nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also." Remember, Jesus is teaching Christians here. 
This is a teaching for believers. Heaven is, is not... Uh, heaven the, the, is to be our, our gaze here, is to be fixed upon heaven. That's where we're seeking rewards, not here. Not in the here and now. I want you to notice that if it were, it would be possible then to lay up rewards in heaven that you, that you never actually get to enter. So, sorry, this idea that, that, that heaven is the reward. That's what I'm trying to get at. Heaven, and I've covered this before, heaven itself is not a reward. Heaven is a gift. Eternal life is a gift. If heaven were the reward, then it would be possible for us to lay up rewards in heaven that we never actually get to go to heaven to enjoy. The idea of the deeds of your life somehow qualifying you to enter heaven is absolutely not in view here whatsoever, else the Sermon on the Mount message would run contrary to the rest of Scripture. And so, Christian... Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moss and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Lay up, store. Israel at this time was not really a place where people laid money in bank accounts. Their wealth was held not so much in gold and silver, but rather in things like livestock and in grain Remember the parable that Jesus tells, Luke chapter 12 and verse 16. The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Well, that parable actually tells us exactly the same story as Jesus' teaching here in the first portion of our text this morning, laying up treasure. Now, actually, the words used here are interesting for us. In the Greek, uh, the, the words thesorizo, lay up, and, and thesoros, treasure, thesaurus, Treasury of words from the same root word here, treasure. And so both of these words, lay up and treasure, actually come from the same root. And so this could be translated, do not treasure up treasure on earth. But why not? Well, Jesus goes on to say treasures here on earth are prone to and in fact destined to be destroyed. Here the moth destroys. That's a reference to the the treasure of clothing. We know in in Jesus' day, um, a a person's financial um, um, estate, um, their financial worth, was often measured in the types of clothing that they weared and the amount of clothing that they owned. The most expensive materials were those materials that were most prone to being eaten by moths. Rust is a a very similar picture here. The word used here is is one in in the New Testament, in the Greek, that's most often translated as eaten, uh, whether by rodents or insects or worms or, or what have you. As I've shown, wealth is usually uh, seen in, in that time, in that, er- in that location, as the storing up of things like grain. And of course, we know that grain stored is prone to mold. 
which could ruin it, or it's prone to insects, which could infest and devour it when it's stored up. And so this is the idea of the word translated here as rust. Now, of course, we're familiar with rust as well. It does exactly the same thing, doesn't it? Rust eats away metal. You can buy the most expensive Ferrari, and even that is vulnerable to rust, just like all other cars. Or, the third danger here that Jesus sets before us is that earthly treasure is prone to theft. Someone can steal it. And, and no matter which one of these takes place, moths, rust, theft, it doesn't really matter. The treasure itself is ruined. Uh, it, it's either ruined or it's no longer in your possession. And the truth is, the stolen car is about as useful to you as the rusted car. Both are worthless. You might own the title but neither do you any good. The but here in the text is, is a word of great contrast, which has been used in, in all of these examples that we've seen uh, of giving, of prayer, of fasting, and here in our text of treasure to show that there is to be a, a, a vast difference between the unbeliever and the believer the, between the hypocrite and the believer, where it comes to our outlook, our attitude, our use of material possessions. Now, we, we, we don't see in our particular text today any mention of the hypocrite, but that has been the pattern throughout our teaching. And, and if we were to consider the scribes and the Pharisees, of course, they would fit that bill, wouldn't they? They considered material possessions as a sign of God's favor on a man's life. And so, they would then naturally try to build such estates as to show themselves to be the ones who were blessed of the, the Lord. And Jesus is saying, listen, that's not our calling. Instead, we are called to have our, our focus on treasure in heaven. That is where we are to lay up or treasure up treasure. You know, Jesus spoke a great deal about money and material possessions and, and wealth. But you know, he, he never spoke of wealth as a bad thing. He never condemned being wealthy. In fact... There was only one person in the New Testament that Jesus called on to sell everything and follow him. And so the issue here is more to do with how one uses or how one views wealth here on earth. As believers, no matter our financial position, we are, we are as, been, as has been shown in, in the model prayer that the Lord Jesus gave, and we took a lot of time going through that, we are to be a people who are daily depending on Him to provide for our needs. Daily. Our Father is our sustainer, not our bank account. Because our God is our provider... We are then free to live with our minds singly focused upon heaven. I recently had the opportunity to preach a message at Nippon Bible College on the theme of fixing our eyes on eternity. Jonathan Edwards' great prayer, Oh God, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. Let me live with that in my vision that that would guide everything that I do. That we would so have our gaze focused on the reality of eternity that the happenings of here and now would all be guided by that truth. Live as to amass treasure there in eternity. Eternal treasure, treasure where no moth and no rust and no thief 
can at all harm what is stored up. Do you, do you, see, do you see my conflict here with what's going on? I, I feel like we're being forced to make a choice between our bank account, our earthly treasure, and fellowship, teaching our children corporately, outreach to the lost, inviting more people to hear the gospel, and all of the rest. Earthly treasure? Heavenly treasure. But I digress. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I love how John MacArthur presents this. He, he says this, Jesus is not saying that if we put our treasure in the right place, our heart will then be in the right place, but rather that the location of our treasure indicates where our heart already is. Spiritual problems are always heart problems. Where our treasure is, is where our concern is. It's where our guiding motivation is. G. Morgan Campbell said, uh, uh, sorry, G. G. Campbell Morgan said this, uh, you are to remember with the passion burning within you that you are not the child of today. You are not of the earth. You are more than dust. You are the child of tomorrow. You are of the eternities. You are the offspring of deity. The measurements of your lives cannot be uh, circumscribed by the point where blue sky kisses green earth. All the fact of your life cannot be encompassed in one small sphere upon which you live. You belong to the infinite. If you make your fortune on the earth, poor, sorry, silly soul, you have made a fortune and stored it in a place where you cannot hold it. Make your fortune, but store it where it will greet you in the dawning of the new morn. Wise words. Earthly wealth is of no use beyond this earth. Heavenly treasure transcends earth and, tr and time. And so, believer, where is your heart? That's the issue in focus here. In Matthew's gospel, we see in chapter 19 that heavenly treasure is laid up by giving to the poor, as well as by the loss of earthly things as a result of living for the gospel. Matthew 25, we see that treasure in heaven is directly linked to the disciples' use of earthly opportunities. You gave me a cup of water. You, you fed me when I was hungry, and, and, and you visited me when I was sick and in prison and all of the rest. Again, heaven is not the reward. We don't gain entry into heaven through any of these, but we certainly do lay up treasure in heaven through all of these. Eternal life is a gift, not a reward, but there are rewards on top of eternal life. And when believers are acknowledged as God's children, those rewards are going to be exposed. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And so, believer, this is the only judgment you are ever going to face. It's the only one. The outcome is already determined. The outcome is determined. 
Heaven, eternal life for all who believe is already guaranteed. We, we see the, the same issue in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 of the judgment that believers will face. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation. Do, do you notice it doesn't say condemnation? Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Believer, you don't have to worry about condemnation. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for all who are in Christ Jesus. But there is one day, a day coming, a judgment of rewards for the believer where your works will be exposed Rewards will be exposed, and God's people will be commended for their service. Well done, good and faithful servant. And so, lay up treasure for that day. Here in verse 21 is where we see this singular use of, of the word your. In the previous verse, the word your was in the plural, general truths presented to all of the crowd who was listening. Here, we see Jesus switch to the singular use. It's not the result of, of some other teachings being bundled together here, but rather, Jesus is now pressing the application of what he just said on each individual hearer at the time. I could say to you each individually, to you, and you, and you, you must apply this to your life. Corporate gathering can't apply it to your life. Only you can do that. And so, where is your treasure personally because where your treasure personally is, that's where your heart personally is. Okay, so let's move on. Verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is in you, uh, the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? I want you to understand, Jesus has not changed topics here. This statement is sandwiched in between these two statements on material possessions, on money, on our view of those things. So, so this is still speaking of that same idea of treasure somehow. The eye is an interesting illustra illustration for us here. The eye, he says, is the lamp of the body. And we could think about this sort of like, sort of like a window, you know. Uh, 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 if, if a room has no window, there is no light entering the room. If a room has a window with discolored glass, it alters, it distorts the light coming into the room. If there's dirt and smudges on the window... It affects that light entering the room. Well, so it is for the body. If light entering is somehow impeded in any way, it affects the operation of the body as a whole. Example, I, I, I play guitar. I, now, th there are exceptions to what I'm about to say. I, 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 I love blues guitar playing. There's a blind blues guitar player that I used to listen to a lot. Um, so, and he's way better at playing guitar than I am. So, yes, there are exceptions to it. But generally speaking, 
Blind people don't play guitar. There's something about sight that's needed for most people, almost universally, to play guitar. So, general statement. Generally, blind people don't play guitar. Walking across a room blind, usually you're somewhat impeded, right? Yes, blind people learn how to use aids to help, but the idea is that the body as a whole is not working correctly without the eyes. If your eye is healthy, if your eye is working, it brings light into your whole body and allows the whole body to function properly. Yet, the word healthy here is, is rather a weak translation in the text. It sure serves its point in the English, but it really misses the idea here. The word here, uh, haplus, is one... I actually like the, how the King James Version translates this, this particular word. He, the King James translates this as single. If your eye is single. The word's principal meaning is just that. Simple or single. And I think, I think that really fits the context here. The eye is single focused. It's either focused on earthly treasure or on heavenly treasure. Because, believer, the truth is it can't be focused on both. It's either focused on God, on heavenly treasure, and and if that's the case, then your eye is good. It's clear, as the NASB translates this. But if it's focused on earthly treasure or money, then your eye is not healthy. It's somehow diminished. At best, you are spiritually like a blind man groping around a room with no light. Now, of course, this fits very well into what we've seen in this chapter so far, doesn't it? Setting our concern on what our Father sees in secret. Focusing on how He views things rather than on the concerns of the world. J.C. Ryle stated this, Singleness of purpose is one of the great secret is one great secret of spiritual prosperity. If our eyes do not see distinctly, we cannot walk without stumbling and falling. If we attempt to work for two different masters, we are sure to give satisfaction to neither. It is just the same with our respect with respect to our souls. We cannot serve Christ and the world at the same time, it is vain to attempt it. The thing cannot be done. Another possible definition of this word hoplo, uh, haplus is, is, has to do with generosity. And of course, that would fit here because Jesus is talking about our view, our attitude, our outlook on financial things, on material things. And so uh, a definition of generosity could certainly also fit in the context. And so holding tightly to earthly treasure is the opposite of generosity. R.T. France writes this, So this rather obscure little saying seems to be using a wordplay in the English translator, which the English translator cannot reproduce without uh, extensive paraphrase in order to commend either single-mindedness in pursuing the values of the kingdom of heaven or in generosity, or more likely both, as a key to the effective life of a disciple. The final comment then underlines... How spiritually disoriented is a life which is not governed by those principles, but rather aims to amass and to hold on to treasure on earth. That's exactly 
the context in view here in Jesus' words. Listen to Proverbs 28, verse 22. I'll, I'll quote from the NASB because I think it just nails this right on. A man with an evil eye hastens after wealth and does not know that the uh, and does not know that want will come upon him you see even in the old testament we see bad or or evil eye is somehow connected with the idea of how one how one views money verse 24 no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Double-mindedness spells disaster. Now, the common interpretation of this passage is that no one can serve two masters. But, I mean, the, the simple truth is that's, that's incorrect. You can serve two masters, right? How many of you have ever moonlighted and held two jobs? You, you actually can serve two masters. So that's not what Jesus is getting at here. Um, rather, the, the word used here in this text is the word duluo. It's The root word is doulos. It means not to be a servant. It means to be a slave. It means to be in bondage as a slave. You cannot be a slave of two masters. Two masters can't share your ownership. And that's what's in view here. And of course, this is, is the picture of of a free will slave, right? A man who is in his service and upon completion of his term as a slave says to himself, my master has treated me so well. He has loved me so well. I'm better off to stay in servitude to my master and so I give myself for the entirety of my life to be his slave. That's what's in view here. It's a willful slavery. The idea then is, which master are you to give yourself willfully to? Are you, are you to give yourself as a slave to money? Or are you to give yourself as a slave to God? Because you can't be a slave of both. And you see... We're still looking at the idea of single-mindedness here, solitary focus. Jesus returns here to, to his point in, in warning his disciples of covetousness. As John Calvin writes, he had formerly said that the heart of man is bound and fixed upon its treasure, and he now gives warning that the hearts of those who are devoted to the riches are alienated from the Lord. As God pronounces everywhere such uh, commendations of sincerity and hates a double heart, all are deceived to imagine that they will be satisfied with half of the, that he will be satisfied with half of their heart. All indeed confess in words that where the, uh, the affection is not entire, there is no true worship of God. But they deny it, in fact, when they attempt to reconcile contradictions as if it were possible for those to be partly employed in serving God who are openly carrying on war against Him. And that's it. You, you, you can't be serving God while actively warring against God in how you view your financial resources. Leon Morris writes, Jesus demands that his followers be wholehearted. It is important that they should not set their minds on anything earthly. He forbids what John Stott calls the materialism which tethers our hearts to the earth. Real treasure is in heaven. It does not consist in material things of any sort. 
the eye of the slave, uh, the eye and the slave are brought into service to emphasize from different angles the importance of single-minded adherence to God. James Montgomery Boyce writes this, Paul wrote in one of his letters about a young man named Damis, who he said had forsaken me having loved this present world. We see the same problem today when people put their home and the care uh, put their home and the care of it above the need for biblical teaching and and uh, mow the grass on on Sunday when they should be at church or when they direct all of their efforts towards amassing a fortune or part of one while neglecting their families and and the essential spiritual life of their home. No wonder Paul wrote to Timothy to remind him that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Jesus was much concerned for the attitude which his disciples would 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 live in where it came to material possessions and money. You know, Jesus actually spoke more about money and material possessions than he did about heaven and hell combined. Money has the ability, material possessions have the ability to lure men into all kinds of evil and thus the need to to secure in Jesus' people a proper understanding and a proper focus on real treasure. Now, for, for us in our culture, we need to be particularly careful here, don't we? A dear friend of, of our family used to say, we, that's all of us here in, in this culture, we here even the very poorest of people here in our city, we are not just rich. We are filthy, stinking rich. Compared to the majority of people in the world. Now, being rich, like I said, is not in any place in the Bible condemned. In fact, there are very prominent figures in the Bible who were rich. Abraham, David, Solomon, we could list many others. Being rich isn't the issue. But how one views wealth and material things is where the problem can lie. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 14. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. And so money isn't evil. The love of money is the problem. Fixing your hope on your wealth clinging to your wealth, making the aim of your life the increase of your wealth, how one uses wealth. That's the issue. Believers are to have their spiritual eyes fixed on heavenly treasure. That, that's where our focus is to be set. You know, as I, as I think about our our, our current conundrum. You know, I, I, think, I think about the reality that, you know, though it would be right for us not to submit, I, I, I genuinely believe it would be right for us not to submit. And yet at the same time, for us not to submit means that rather than supporting missionaries with our finances and doing God's work in the world through our finances, we pay for some politician to take another vacation. And at the end of the day, I'm just, I'm just left here, even though I know 
with every fiber of my being, I know what they're doing is wrong and that we should not submit and we should fight, it would, it would, it would deplete our finances in such a hurry. It would close the doors of the church in such a hurry. And, and, and it's not holding on to that for the sake of holding on to that, but it's that God has given us a work to do. And so how do we... How do we somehow, in the midst of all the nonsense, how do we somehow still honor God? In how we meet, in how we fellowship, and in our financial stewardship. How do we we somehow do all of that? And so we're trying to submit, even though... I actually don't believe it's right of us to do so. But that's where we're at. We're trying to have our eyes set on heavenly treasure. We're trying to set that as our focus. Allow me to close uh, once again with the words of Jim Boyce. Talking about spiritual eyes fixed on heavenly treasure. He asks this question, is that you? Is that true for you? Have things become your God? Don't forget that these things are written to Christians and that they are therefore meant to make you ask whether the Lord God Almighty occupies, occupies the central place in your life or whether things obscure Him. If you think most about your home, your car, your vacation, your bank account, your clothes, your investments, then you are building your treasure on earth. And according to Jesus, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this text. Lord, we desire that our life, that our church would be about honoring you and about nothing else. And we need wisdom We need to know what that looks like, Father. Um, Father, we pray that you would continue to sustain your church. We pray that each of us individually, that we would be singularly focused, solitarily focused upon you, upon your glory, upon your honor, and that we would use the great blessings that you've given us materially to that end, that we would honor you with all things that you've blessed us with, that we would live so as to bring with every ounce of our lives honor and glory to our Father, our great Savior, for your great love for us, that we would live in gratitude to you in these things. Father, set our, our, our focus right. Set our attitudes right where it comes to material possessions, Father. We pray this, that your name be honored. In Jesus' name, amen.